cool thing about special effects is that you know when you take the camera out and start looking at the real world, uh, everything in the real world is fair game. So it's uh, you know everything from galaxies to microbes that you might look at could be could be in a movie. The the most interesting part of this though is that. Uh, the large majority of movies deal with humans and human beings, or at least humanoid creatures that, that are similar to human beings. So, in that sense, a lot of movies happen at what I would call the human scale. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you trick somebody down like in an inner space movie or something and, and, and change uh, it a little bit, but it's still that human interacting with things that people can relate to. So, if you start thinking CG in a CG environment, it's everything that a human being could interact with as part of the CG environment. And so, we get most involved in. And that sort of stuff, you know, from uh, you know, water for movies like uh, Poseidon and Pirates of the Caribbean, it just came out. In fact, I got a screen credit on Poseidon. I, I've gotten a couple of credits, yes. and uh, both those films are nominated for uh, the Oscar this year for uh, special effects, and uh, all the way to like more mundane things you might not even recognize, like like uh, clothing. For example, in Terminator 3, there was a shot where Arnold was laying on his back. And they stomped on his head. The other two said, "Knock his head off." <laughs> uh, you couldn't use a real Arnold for that. Uh, but uh, they, they, when we did that, we, we had to put in a, a digital double, and for the digital double, we need clothing and, and things like that. So, a leather jacket. We spent a lot of time modeling. Directors sometimes come in and say things like, "You know, that wave needs to be higher, or needs to move faster." They want a lot of non-physical stuff, mm -hmm. and the non-physical stuff is there because they're trying to get at the human brain and the way someone perceives the movie and telling the story. In fact. When you have something like a liquid terminator, the liquid is the character, and so it has to act a certain way. But it's uh, even a more subtle, in a subtle way, like when you have the ocean and it's doing something, you want certain waves in a perfect storm. You need that one big wave to come out and pick the ship up and, and crash it down. Yeah. And when you're doing that sort of thing, you need to tell the story with the with the uh, with the science. And so there's a lot of that human perception, like how the brain works and what it wants to do, it comes into it. There's two separate challenges. The first challenge you have to come up against is how do you make something that looks like water on film, like just any water? And so people look at it and don't say, oh, what is that supposed to be? They have to recognize that it's water. Same thing with the jacket or clothing. It has to look like a jacket or a piece of clothing. Mm -hmm. The second big challenge is making something which is uh, model specific. So uh, you might make something that looks like a leather jacket, but it might not look like the leather jacket that, that Arnold was wearing during the movie. And so in that sense, it has to, it has to look uh, it's sort of the next level of realism. And I think in special effects, we're sort of getting to that level where we can do better than just make uh, digital doubles or uh, uh, put clothing on characters and stuff, but we can style the clothing such that you can splice back and forth between the, uh, the real character and the computer-generated character and uh, not recognize differences in these two things. Right. For Poseidon, they actually filmed a bunch of stuff in a wave tank. And there was no ship in Poseidon. It didn't, it didn't exist. The whole ship was, uh, was CG. CG. And so all the ocean water was CG, but when they were in the life raft at the end, they wanted that to be real. So they put the people in a little tank. The tank's this tiny little thing with these little sort of waves. They go, okay, we have to have a, a giant ocean liner with the ocean around it and somehow merge that in gracefully to the ship in a little wave tank. And so when you look at it on screen, you might see water that looks uh, too smooth or water that maybe has too many angles and stuff in it and reflecting too much light. And what you're seeing there are the actual errors in the, in the scheme. So the goal is to pick the methods wisely such that the errors actually look like water too. And that's how you uh, uh, fool somebody. Now the really have no difference, and not just visual, but really have no difference, you need to get into the computational physics uh, regime, which is to get it down to like half a percent error. And that's not gonna be feasible for a while. As you get more and more computational power, you have a better and better shot. One of the things that's held that back, though, is a lot of the classical uh, numerical analysts, the paper and pencil people, uh, have had students that mostly have one, one machine on their desk and haven't had the big supercomputers. So while we have at Los Alamos and Livermore, there's been a disconnect between those two things. In fact, the biggest example of disconnect is Fortran versus C. These days, you can't find students who know Fortran, yet a lot of the codes, the legacy codes at Los Alamos still use Fortran. <laughs> so, you know, there's a big disconnect between what I would call commodity hardware and programming and uh, the high-end stuff for, for, the, for the government. And I think one of the nice things that companies like Intel are doing is, is getting rid of that disconnect. Intel recently announced uh, this 80-core uh, chip. So once every student in every lab of every numerical analyst has 
you know, 80 cores on his chip, maybe a couple of his chips in a machine, then everyone's walking around with a little mini supercomputer. And you start thinking differently. Instead of thinking of serial numerical algorithms to model these uh, phenomena, you start thinking of parallel algorithms uh, a lot more. I think it's going to really help push to the next generation.